Hello, I'm Lux, the Keeper of the Brush. And I remember, somebody please save me. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, French Biz Magic. Season 7, Episodes 25 and 26, Shadow Play, Part 1 and Part 2, a.k.a. Season Finale. So we found out where the Tree of Harmony came from. And what happened to all these legendary ponies. Though I didn't realize that Sanibelia was going to be one of the legendary ponies. It didn't actually click in my head as, oh, yeah, she'd be one of them. But I could obviously tell by the stories in the campfire episode that those were definitely going to be brought up at the season finale. Yes, yeah, so those three were a definite. And then the healer pony was a definite because she was another one that they said disappeared without a trace. So that gave us four obvious ones. And then Cenebula makes sense. So if you look at the pattern as a whole, that gives us five. And the fact that we saw that it was Star Swirl's journal made six. And people have been theorizing that Star Swirl was either the creator of the Elements of Harmony in some way or something like that because he's such an important character in the background to Celestia, Luna, and Twilight. Especially with the journal, the Two Sisters journal, which is still canon. And this episode kind of hammers it in more that it was canon. Because Star Swirl says, well, you're a lot taller than I remember. Yes, which confirms he knew the two sisters when they were younger, which means more than a thousand years ago. Because when we see the flashbacks of them fighting with Discord and the transformation of Luna into Nightmare Moon and her subsequent banishment, they look basically like the same adult alicorns that they look now. So we're talking well over a thousand years ago. And I'm thinking it's at least a minimum of 2,000 years ago, especially based on phrasing and stuff like that. They often use like more than a thousand years ago, but Sunburst specifically uses a word that means multiple thousands of years ago. I don't think they wanted to lock themselves into a specific date. And because 1,000 is already so specific and already been used, they just went for more than, though I think it would have just been fun to make it 10,000 and just have a Power Rangers callback. After 10,000 years, I'm free! Time to conquer Earth! Yeah, 10,000 years ago, Earth probably wasn't worth conquering. <laughs> yeah. So how would she know that, getting straight out of the space dumpster? But hey, logic and children's shows, and back to MLP. <laughs> Uh, at least we're not talking about science in anime. I like cat girls. I do too. Wow. <laughs> uh, so how do you think they handled it? I got the feeling that you thought it was, hmm, this is good. Nothing too surprising. Well, I was expecting something a little stronger. I didn't think we were going to go back like Rainbow Mane power because that thing's never going to show up again because the toys didn't sell and it was probably horrible to animate. But I thought it was going to be a little more season five Tyrick type finale than more like the whole thing with Starlight's two-parter season opener. Yeah, I thought the Pony of Shadows was actually one of the weakest overall villains, as in power level. He felt very kind of like the main six could take him in their sleep kind of power level. Yeah, it was like, wait a minute, it took six of you to banish him to Limbo and you had to go with him? I mean, they did say when he came back that he was in a weakened state, but still, he seems like lower than Discord. Mm -hmm. He seems like so weak, like Nightmare Moon feels more powerful than him. I mean, King Sombra felt stronger and we barely saw Sombra. So it felt off kilter that it took the ancient equivalent of the main six, you know, these pillars, to take out the Pony of Shadows, though they do give a lot of explanations for why the Pony of Shadows is not as powerful in modern times, because they point out how there are fewer places of darkness in Equestria. Also, if they've been all alone in limbo for the past thousand plus years, the Pony of Shadows hasn't had anyone to feed off of because the pillars were all on the side of light. It's also pointed out that Limbo is neither a here nor there place, so no time has passed. So 
the Pony of Shadows shouldn't be any weaker because the pillars aren't any weaker because technically for them no time has passed. Time doesn't start for them until they're pulled back into Equestria. The Pony of Shadows should have still been at the same strength he was when he was banished to Limbo. Which means that he deteriorated in power extremely quickly because there wasn't much for him to feed on in Equestria because there weren't those places of darkness. Because the Tree of Harmony has probably spread its influence over around. such a wide portion of Equestria. Especially with Starsworld stating that Equestria is much larger than what he remembers it being. So the borders of the kingdom itself has spread, the Tree of Harmony has grown and spread its power and been strengthened over the generations by the harmony maintained by Pony Kind. Plus a thousand years of growth can do that with Celestia and Luna's influence and Celestia's influence over that time period really causing peace and harmony to strengthen the tree and the tree then strengthens that harmony. So it's a positive continuous cycle. Kind of like the Crystal Heart. The Crystal Heart rejuvenates and increases the um, friendship in its area, and it also is fed by that friendship every cycle. Yes, yeah, so it's reciprocative. It just means that if all that's true, then if there was so little darkness for the Pony of Shadows to feed on, why did we have to go and banish the Pony of Shadows again? Well, that's because Star Swirl's default setting was banishment. Because that's what he did to the sirens. Banish them. Instead of talking with them or trying to come up with a spell that would help, you know, maybe disabling their power so you could actually talk to them without them going, mind control! Yes, or finding something else for them to feed on, like how the changelings no longer feed on love in the sense of stealing it from others. Could there have been a way, something else they could have done with the sirens? Like how in the movie, they took the main six plus Sunset Shimmer managed to destroy their singing ability, you know, the gems, mm -hmm. which took away their power. Though this reminds me of a point that was brought up to me in an article online when I was watching some more reviews for the My Little Pony movie, is the reason we actually didn't see Starlight or the Changelings much in the movie is because most of the movie was written well before those arcs in the series were written. And it was mostly through production by the time these characters were introduced into the cycle. So they actually couldn't be much added to the movie by the time it was most of the way through production. Which makes sense. But adding a simple couple of lines of dialogue to explain them away, even if you didn't have time to go back in and actually animate them into the movie, adding a couple of lines of dialogue would have addressed the issue without having to make huge alterations to the movie, which would have been very costly. But back to the finale. I just thought I'd bring that up since I found it out after our recording. And I did like that whole callback to the Dazzlings and how Star Swirled was the one who banished them. And I think the reason we only heard about Star Swirled in the original story is because Star Swirled was only known in that small version of Equestria back then. The other pillars probably weren't that well known in that section because they all were known in their own sections, which eventually became part of Equestria. Mm -hmm. And that's how the stories came down to being known by the ponies in Ponyville, because we heard about three of the pillars through Campfire Tales. But I think it's also because they may not have been together as a group for very long. Because we don't know how much time passed between when Styxian first gathered them together and when they all went to Limbo. Because there's only the amount of time between when they leave their home provinces to join with Star Swirl and Styxian to when they all go to Limbo to build a reputation. And we don't know how long that was. Yeah, that particular time period is never stated. It's just stated that he took their items, he turned. Had a final showdown. We find out later that it was because they banished him and themselves to Limbo. Though it's kind of interesting how they brought the elements of Harmony back in the original way in this episode, because the Tree of Harmony relies on that for being alive. So are we going to have to put the elements back 
next season or are they permanently out because star swirled and the pillars are back and they can do something to feed the tree to maintain it or because there's a lot of questions that are left open especially with the ending it's like i know he's gonna go wandering and everything but what about the pillars who their homes are completely gone now <laughs> because the guy with the shovel his village is completely gone it's an excavation site now the lady in the swamp is going to come back to an empty village and just her house who's been maintained by her relatives who are going to go what <laughs> <laughs> Snebula's area is complete ruins uh, so Nebula's area is in complete ruins well her original area is in ruins where she was living but there's still settlements around it yeah there's still settlements around it there's still the village where her deeds are honored she can go back there and be worshipped practically it's just it seems like like they're gonna come back to a lot of hardship I don't know what we're gonna do with that they could do a lot with that like we could actually have some of the pillars be villains in the season opener next season because they're so bitter about what they came back to or just because they're having trouble adjusting to all the modern changes that have been made because we did see one of the pillars in what looked like Manhattan of all places so just the disorientation of the things that have occurred and the changes in technology and something they managed to gloss over rather well well actually not rather well the book, Star Wars Journal, is an old ponish. Why do all the pillars speak perfect modern day equestrian? Ah, I was going to say the Star Trek rule, but that's not correct. It's the Star Wars rule because everyone speaks English in there unless it's not. Then they do a fake language. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in Star Trek, the universal translator was just a good way to get around having to come up with other languages. Yeah, but... That doesn't make sense here because even if there was a spell that they enacted to act as a universal translator, wouldn't that have only been cast upon the pillars and wouldn't have only been done by Twilight after they were unable to communicate? Because both written and spoken languages evolve over time. So by making it very clear that the journal was written in an old language. With very bad horn writing. That, that's a nice touch how people do have bad horn writing. Yes, that just because you can magically control a quill doesn't mean you have neat handwriting. It's as much subject to error as anything else. I also like the fact that, oh, I can read this because my handwriting is worse. <laughs> that was awesome. And it was a nice way to bring Starlight into it that she's reading it. So we're getting to hear pieces of it. And then Twilight and Sunburst are translating what she says. That's another thing. I wonder if they actually took the time to actually make a basic language for use in the show of Old Punch, you know, a basic version of it, because it takes a long time to come up with a language and at least a base language that you can build off of. Yeah, an actual viable language, not just going, okay, we're going to make Apple equal. Yeah, you have to come up with syntax and stuff like that. And vowels and consonants and how sentences are structured grammatically because grammar is different in different languages because some put the subject in the beginning some put it at the end some put it at the middle some repeat it throughout we're talking about pizza yes we are talking about pizza we are definitely talking about pizza pizza is good pizza is what we want definitely pizza and then other languages expect you to remember it from the very beginning so if you come into a middle of a conversation you are sol because the topic was at the beginning mm -hmm. and you just have to infer it they're talking about something wrong with topics <gasps> oh pizza and then other ones are like, okay, I like pepperoni, mushrooms, olives. And then you get to the very end of the conversation. Yeah, we're ordering a pizza. Yeah, it makes me wonder if they actually took the time to at least come up with a, at least some type of cipher for regular English. So what I mean by that is they have a sheet of fake words they came up with and they go, this one sounds like this. So we're going to have this replace this word. And it's just basically English with a fake coding on top of it to basically encrypt it. Mm-hmm. Kind of like some of the puzzles you decrypt in video games, like one of the journal entries in the Bravely Default game where everything, you write out the journal entry and it's like all backwards. So just something simple like that where they could do a quick transition. So mm -hmm. a basic key just to get the few words, or did they just randomly go, this sounds good. I know we usually save nitpicks for later, but that's kind of a big thing. As they didn't even have... 
I mean, they had some regional accents, but their speech patterns didn't even sound archaic, not even to the point of what it sounded like when they were described in the tales. Mm -hmm. Or when Luna first spoke after coming back. Yes, she had the more archaic type, and we've already established that this was before then, so you would think it would be at least that archaic, if not more so. I wonder if they planned on it, but then they realized the script would become too cumbersome at one point, so they chopped it out. It's possible, because this was a lot to fit in two episodes. And it's not one of those ones that felt rushed because of that either. Everything was well paced to me. It's just there's little holes and areas you're like, well, there's that and there's that. Didn't feel rushed because those things were left out, but it felt like, yeah, you maybe could have put these things in. And also, I know it's hard to do in flashbacks, but with the whole thing with the sirens, if they could have shown more of a time lapse, like attacking village A, attacking village B, do some sort of transition to show that this was ongoing and that there was more than one confrontation or that the pillars had to keep working to track them down before we got to the final banishment because something has to be a pretty big scourge if your answer is i'm going to send it to another dimension because it just felt so quick just a couple of quick cuts from village to village of the pillars they could have even been like done a cut where Stixian sees them then runs off then we have like a some type of transition that indicates a period of time passes and he comes back with them instead of him just disappearing coming back with the pillars because they weren't that close no because they were from all different areas so it takes time to assemble a team like that and while we can't really take the time to show the time some cuts and edits and transitions could have been used to imply the time also something i haven't brought up yet why wasn't star thrills voiced by patrick stewart no offense to Christopher Bitten, but we were really hoping for Patrick Stewart. Yeah, especially since Star Wars World's now in the era where Discord is. Because it looks like Star Wars World was before Discord, so he doesn't even know about Discord yet. And it would have been great to have Patrick Stewart voicing against John DeLancey in just some scene of Star Wars World going, You're an odd creature, or something like that. Or even like some type of tweak of lines from Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Of course, if... Starshold said anything like that, Discord would be like, why, thank you, I do try my humble best. Oh, <laughs> uh, because that, that would have been such a great moment, but I have a feeling they either couldn't get him, didn't have the time, or actually couldn't get him because he was a fan suggestion. Because sometimes that does happen. Not that Christopher Britton isn't a very accomplished actor. We mean no disrespect. It's just, from a fan standpoint, it would have been fun. And Star Swirl is the type of character that you could see Patrick Stewart playing. Oh, yeah. And like we said, no offense to that guy. He did an excellent job for Star Swirl. There was great tone in him. Great expression, great tone, very measured pace. Sounded very much like what we would think Star Swirl would sound like. He's just not Patrick Stewart. Who can't be except for Patrick Stewart? Nobody, and that's the problem. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh... So what were your favorite moments from these two episodes? Really more at the end where Twilight finally starts listening to Starlight because Starlight is the voice of reason in all of this. Twilight is so obsessed with being able to bring the greatest unicorn sorcerer of all time back that she's not thinking things all the way through, which is very much not like Twilight. And then she's so busy trying to regain and regain isn't even the right word because Star Swirl didn't know her and is annoyed with her from the very moment of meeting her. So trying to earn his respect that she's so focused on undoing what she did that she's not exploring any avenue other than, okay, we have to re-banish the Pony of Shadows without understanding what kind of threat he represents. You know, we've had over a thousand years not just new changes in magic, but new strategies, new tactics, new new everything. The elements of harmony themselves, you've talked about how they actually work. The fact that they purify or fix or modify or temporarily move out of. Because I have a feeling that the elements of harmony petrified Discord because they somehow knew at one point Discord could be turned. So they didn't destroy him because 
What's the best way to maintain harmony? Get rid of Discord. But instead of getting rid of him, the elements saw that there could be good in him and just put him out of the way until they sensed a moment where he could be led to a better way of using his chaotic powers for actually maintaining harmony. Because a little chaos, you need that contrast to actually give people the sense of what harmony actually is. Because it's like they say, there can't be heroes without people cheering on the sidelines. If everyone's at the same level, there's no contrast. You can't have light without dark. This is why a lot of Eastern philosophies aren't about getting rid of evil. It's about understanding it or coming out with something that balances it out. I think there's even like, I'm not an expert on it or anything, but I seem to remember hearing at one point that there actually wasn't any word for evil spirits, just unbalanced spirits in one of the Asian cultures. There's no such thing as an evil spirit. It's just a spirit that's out of balance that could be brought back into balance. Not that it's evil, but that it's... In need of correction. So it wasn't that it was evil, it's that it was unbalanced. And if that balance could be restored, then the spirit was okay. Yeah, I like the pacing. I like Starf's world, even though it's not Patrick Stewart. The guy who did it still did an excellent job. I liked the other ponies. I liked their accents. But you're right, they should have been either speaking in old Ponish or not understanding. Maybe not even speaking old Ponish, but speaking in different languages. When you look at how far flung and the differences in what the cultures look like in the flashbacks and how those equate to various human regions and cultures, there should have been more variance. So I think that was more cut for time. Mm -hmm. Though another thing to point out is the fact that the healing lady, her diary was written in regular pony because Twilight and Fluttershy could both read it. Which is interesting because Star Swirl's book up to the very end was in Old Ponish. So was Star Swirl old enough that Old Ponish was already on the way out and he just continued to write in his journal because it was his first language? Or he was like Renaissance people. Renaissance people, when they wrote down stuff or designed things, they either wrote it in code or a different language that wasn't understood at the time. So it could have been that, or it could have been like how some people write in Latin because it's such a precise language. Because it's a dead language, it stays very precise and is very specific and unchanging. There are people who are multilingual who will take something they're trying to say in English or their first language translate it into Latin and translate it back to make sure that they're getting it as clear as possible. So that's a possibility. And that would explain why they all speak pony. Also, if they wanted to do that, um, another way they could have done it is Twilight couldn't have understood them. And then they ended up in front of Celestia and Luna and Celestia and Luna could speak that language and translate for them. And then Twilight could go, oh, magic. There we go, fixed. Well, just not being able to understand them Twilight probably could have gotten magic fix even without going to Celestia and Luna. Because if we had gone to Celestia and Luna, I think we would have cut out a lot of this banishing the Pony of Shadows and gone for alternatives. Hmm. Even though, you know, Celestia imprisoned Luna in the moon, Celestia and Luna imprisoned Discord as a statue. We tend to be more about redeeming the villains. There's only the occasional banishment, like... Derek. Or self-banishment, Chrysalis. Or, you know, when Starlight ran off after being defeated. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she did get redeemed in the end. And that redemption was what Twilight went for. She didn't try to get rid of Starlight. She tried to undo the harm that Starlight was doing. And Starlight made an excellent foil for pointing out that you don't always have to fight. And Starswell was so focused on, he's evil, he's darkness, he tried to hurt us, we need to get rid of him. And Starlight's like, you guys can talk. And Starswell's so focused on, no, there's no redeeming a villain. And you're like, you're talking to one. Hello! <laughs> yeah. I can actually point out three villains around here that have been redeemed. <laughs> I don't know if there was actually three, but I'm just saying. There's Discord, there's... Nightmare Moon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, three, including... Yeah. Yeah. I just pulled that number out of thin air, but I was actually right. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... And it was a contrast because she's pointing out, I'm a living example, 
not just of any pony, but of a unicorn who wanted greater power because she was envious and was redeemed. So she and Sixium were very similar in that way. Mm -hmm. They felt left behind and betrayed by their friends and tried to overcome it in a negative way. Hmm. Though I also like how we point out again the differences between Twilight's magic and Starlight's magic. How Twilight's more of a defense magic, how she's more of control compared to Starlight's, who's more of like power and attack. Because Twilight could barely hold her own against the Pony of Shadow's magic when he went for the second powered up attack. But then Starlight comes out on her and goes, she's got me. <laughs> <laughs> and boom. Because <laughs> that's the real contrast between their two styles of magic. Yeah, as Twilight's is more defensive. And Twilight is technically the more powerful unicorn. But it's the differences in the aptitudes of their magic. Also, reemphasizing there, the just... The two of them were able to drive off the Pony of Shadows. We really needed to banish this guy to Limbo again? Two unicorns. Okay, one alicorn, one unicorn. We're able to knock back his attacks. And I love how, like, Star Swirl barely blinks an eye at the fact that Twilight's an alicorn. That's another thing that kind of confirms the Two Sisters Journal. Because alicorns were a race in that book. And Star Swirl knew about that so his calmness at the fact that there's another unicorn though also depending on how you interpret the journal of the two sisters he may have actually been aware of twilight in some way with mm -hmm. all the time travel spells okay so just to get out of the way a little more nitpicking some good contrast here out of all of these special artifacts first lux has an answer for this but how were the artifacts scattered because all the artifacts were gathered at Pwnhenge when the banishment spell was cast and also of all the artifacts the correct member of the main six had previously handled one of the artifacts specifically the healer's mask so why didn't the mask react then well my answer to the first part of that question which is why weren't they all there what happened to them is the Animation for that event did something very specific for all items except for Star Swirl's journal, which there's another question there of how did the journal get out of Pwnhidge? But if you look at that animation, all the other objects disappeared as they hit. So I'm thinking Star Swirl built into the spell because he made the spell, he probably knows how to undo it, so he made it harder to undo the spell by sending the objects to the respective locations or, or locations that were hard to find because we see even though there are important areas to the objects one of them was put in the desert near dragon territory and that's not where the object would have been left that's where the object was used in the story because they were dealing with dragons not where the object ended up at the end of the story because flash magnus got to keep the shield and since we're talking about the shield, if I may, the interesting way of them obtaining it. Because Spike technically won it in the first race. Rainbow Dash could have won the second race easily and in no time. But instead, she does the Flash Magnus thing of tricking the dragons. So she doesn't waste time winning the race, even though it would have only taken her a few seconds. But then she would have been at the top. And she would have been surrounded by other dragons who might have taken Garble's side. So instead, she tricks Garble out of the shield, sacrifices a bit of her pride by not bothering to win the race, and takes the shield and Spike, which are more important. And my other answer to why the mask, even though I brought up when we were discussing this earlier outside of the podcast, I was actually the one who brought up like, so why didn't Fluttershy's mask react? My immediate answer in my head once I said that out loud was, well, the table wasn't activated at the time. I think the table magically enhanced the objects because it is connected to the objects in such a way that it lit them up so when the appropriate pony touched them, that's when they would light up to confirm that this is the object you were looking for. Kind of like when the cutie marks light up. Yes, because since the seed from the Elements of Harmony came from the pillars, there's a connection between the Tree of Harmony, the Elements of Harmony, the Pillars themselves, and the Pillars' objects. They're all connected. 
which is why the tree reacted to Star Soul's journal being read inside of it. So yeah, those are my basic answers and theories. Yes, and it's also interesting that we don't have them make an exact match of pony type to pony type with the elements because the healer is an earth pony but is paired with Fluttershy who is a pegasus. It might also be another illustration of the fact that the elements of harmony are about balance. So it's still two, two, and two. It's just arranged differently based on the natures of the ponies. It's less about what they are and more about who they are. But it's interesting how well they all mesh together, you know, each counterpoint, because the original pillars elements are different than the modern elements. But each one that was paired up was very comfortable with each other. And if Star Swirl hadn't been being such a pompous jerk of you broke my spell and now I have to fix it, he and Twilight probably would have gotten on really well. And probably will in the future. We're probably actually going to get episodes in season eight of the main six interacting with the old main six. Yes, very much so, even though at the very least Star Swirl is going to be traveling. I bet the others do some traveling as well, and they may be accompanied by members of the main six or even support character ponies because they're going into a version of Equestria that they don't know. It would be helpful to have someone more familiar with the modern era to travel with. So that could be some very interesting story points. And a good way to visit more areas outside of Equestria or in Equestria or just places we haven't been. And ways to see the world with new eyes because you have characters who will be looking at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And we still haven't been to Saddle Arabia, even though it's been mentioned multiple times. Yes, and we've seen representatives from Saddle Arabia, but we've never been there. I'd also like to point out this reiterates the season three finale that while Star Swirl was an amazing unicorn sorcerer, he didn't have the deeper understanding of friendship because his pillar element is pure magic, where Twilight's is more the magic of friendship. Even though she has amazing magical abilities, she didn't feel that spark until her new friend showed up. So we really see the contrast there because they're both Star Swirl and Twilight are accomplished unicorn magicians but Star Swirl doesn't have that deeper understanding of friendship, which is how the misunderstanding came into place. And his interpretation of the misunderstanding with Styxian spread to the other pillars and led to the larger misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. You have more? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a couple more things that came up in pre-discussion that Twilight trusted Starlight enough that she finally listened, that she could finally see past her idol worship of star swirl to listen to starlight and go this doesn't seem right there is a pony in there we need to help him banishment isn't the answer there's more that we can do and she takes the step to do that more you know to reach out to some pony that she's never met and try to heal things between them because she can now see past the pony of shadows and see Styxian. Which is what Starlight was seeing from the beginning. And Starlight can bring Twilight to that understanding. And I like how Star Swirl at the end was like, yeah, you don't need to look to me for wisdom anymore. You have a student who's... Yes, and uh, yes, apparently I'm going to be making a lot of apologies today. Yes, apparently a conversation can save the world. Always try talking first. Violence is always your last option. Uh, that reminds me of one of the RPG podcasts I listened to recently, where one of the guys had the power of negotiation is always an option. <laughs> it would give him a boost to his talking roles. Because of this, he negotiated his way out of everything. Yes, I'm going to negotiate that this vicious wolf doesn't attack me. I'm going to negotiate that this guard doesn't lock me up for public drunkenness. <laughs> I'm going to negotiate that these supplies are free. <laughs> I know that actually happened in the podcast, You just because... Ember doesn't listen to the same one, but those are all good. <laughs> I would so do those. <laughs> I also liked how, going back to getting the objects, that we didn't spend all season on that like we did for the keys to the box. They were relatively easy to get because mm -hmm. they were just a tool. And I like how they integrated the legends into the series. It wasn't a quest for anything. They were just kind of dropped along the way, like how Cenebula was just dropped in a Daring Do episode. 
I didn't even realize he was an important character. I was like, oh, that's a nice story. It illustrates what's going on with Daring Do and stuff like that. Wow. Oh, no, that's an actual character we're bringing back later. That one was the best way to do it. The other ones were a little, in a way, ham-fisted because they were in these stories, but it still worked. So Nebula's story was still told as a story, but we weren't getting that classic set of three all at once. You know, that felt more like a setup. So Nebula's story was more organic. And they didn't repeat over and over again in the episode, she mysteriously disappeared and no one ever heard of her again. In all the other episodes, that was repeated multiple times. Especially with the healer. So that was hammering in the fact that this pony disappeared. That means they're going to come back because nobody knows what happens. Therefore, just like how characters get written out of soap operas, there's always the opportunity to come back. More points? Uh, I think we're probably about ready to wrap it up. We really shouldn't make the podcast longer than the actual episodes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, final thoughts? In a way, it was a lot milder than I was expecting. And, you know, my first huge nitpick of Twilight, did you not take into account how are you getting only the pillars back? They were all banished in the same spell. How are you managing to reverse and only bring back six of seven? So why didn't she calculate how to get only six of seven? And if she was going to get seven of seven, why didn't she have something handy to take care of the Pony of Shadows right then? Because she's Twilight's freaking sparkle. The pony who plans for everything. Yeah, she's got lists for lists. But apparently the one thing she didn't plan for was her idol not wanting his spell undone. He cast the spell for a reason. But apparently the tree wanted them back because it knew it was a friendship problem that needed to be solved. Because otherwise, why would the tree have helped? Yeah, the tree did help. So the tree knows more. And so the tree, being a tree, ha having this longer lifespan, also limbo, time doesn't pass there. We have enough people to now fix this. So when the journal turned up and was brought back to the tree, the tree went, oh, hey, we can do something about this. Guys, you want to do something about this? I really liked the flow, and you're right. It did feel like a very subdued version of a season finale. It wasn't this big, epic thing. It was more like a longer version of a single episode. And it was handled really well. It gave more time for the correct pacing to hit the right notes. And we didn't need a big epic battle because that's not what happened at the end. It was just them showing up, getting some more exposition, them setting off the spell, them correcting the spell, and them saving... Styxian and sending the actual darkness to Limbo. I just wish we could have gotten more out of the Pony of Shadows as a villain because, okay, he looks like a freaking shadow alicorn. And male, that is like the antithesis of the entire equestrian hierarchy. One, the girls are in charge. Two, the girls are alicorns. There was so much more that could have been done with that layout that wasn't. And I want to find out more about this town that was abandoned. Because it's the only dark spot left in Equestria, apparently. And it looks like it's been around for as long as the pillars have. And if you look at it, it had the whole Pony of Shadow theme. So was that where the darkness originally came from? Did the darkness possess different ponies over time and Styxian was just the latest victim of it? Or did the Pony of Shadows take and make that spot for himself before he was banished? Yeah, there's a lot of questions there. Because that would be a place if I ended up in a video game and it was one of those open world ones, I would spend hours just walking around looking at everything. So... Outro. Outro. And this has been our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 7. Episodes 25 and 26, Shadow Play, Part 1 and Part 2, Season 7 Finale. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Lux's art, you can find more of it on Tumblr, Twitter, DeviantArt, a couple Mastodon servers, Google+, Facebook, Reddit if he remembers. If you really enjoy Lux's art and want some of your own, he does take commissions. Check the link for pricing and availability. We are going into the fall season. There's already a couple people bugging him for Christmas. Get in now for your Christmas gifts. If you enjoyed this particular podcast, please like, subscribe, comment. Really enjoying the discussions we're getting going lately in the comments. We have tons of other videos. You can check those out. Okay, now for the typical money pitch.
<laughs> Don't want any custom art, but still have a few bits to throw our way. We have a Patreon and a coffee. Patreon starts at $1, which gets you access to monthly sketches along with voting rights for future sketches. Coffee works in increments of three and also doesn't work like a subscription. So if you really just want a one-time deal, then coffee's your thing. Thank you again.